Hello and welcome to Let the Stone Speak. I'm Brent Nachtigal, coming to you today from Jerusalem, Israel, from the Armstrong Institute of Biblical Archaeology. Thank you very much for joining me. On today's program, towards the second half, we've got a really exciting uh, speech that'll be given to you. This is about a 10-minute excerpt of a uh, some comments that Professor Josef Garfinkel of Hebrew University gave a week and a half ago to an audience in Oklahoma. He was there at uh, the Armstrong, uh, Herbert W. Armstrong College, which is the uh, institution that supports archaeological excavations here in Jerusalem underneath the Armstrong Institute of Biblical Archaeology. And Professor Garfinkel was visiting there, and he happened to uh, speak be lined up to speak there about some more of his excavations in Kirbet Kayafa and Kirbet al Rai and other places in Israel. But it just so happened that he was there the day that one of his, if not the most important discovery that he's ever made, was released to the public. And this is the all he is what is calling he is calling the oldest alphabetical inscription ever discovered in terms of a full sentence. And this was found on a on an ivory comb so very exciting comments from him himself mr uh, professor garfinkel so you'll want to listen to those in the second half before we get to that though i just want to um bring out an article that was just released in biblical archaeology review this is entitled misha's stella and the house of david and so if you're familiar with archaeological debates Over the past uh, 30 years, the most iconic figure of this debate is King David himself. This is someone that we are um, very much into uh, providing as much evidence as possible for his reign, at least being honest with the discoveries that have been made in Jerusalem and elsewhere. It's one of the reasons we're working with Professor Garfinkel because of his excavations date to this critical time period going back 3,000 years to the time period of King David. No doubt you've heard of the Tel Dan Stela. Uh, this is a, a victory stela or a big monumental uh, inscription written on stone that was discovered in Tel Dan all the way into the north of Israel, discovered in 1993 in secondary use in a wall up there. And that mentioned the house of David, Bet David, as it said on that inscription. And so this was an amazingly important discovery um, because it put to rest the the debate whether King David was an actual historical personality. Of course, he's mentioned throughout the Bible, biblical promises based on him, biblical authors all the way through the Old Testament, uh, talking about King David as a historical personality. Some believed that he was historical fiction or a recreation or a creation of later authors. Um, some people still believe this to this day in terms of the, the grand acclaim that the Bible puts with King David. However, today they accept his existence based on this discovery that came out 30 years ago. Now, there is another inscription, the Misha Stella or the Moabite stone, that in 1992, uh, some archaeologists or some uh, epigraphers, uh, one which Andre Lamar, Lamare, if I've pronounced your name incorrectly, apologies. He came out and said that this inscription, which was discovered about 150 years earlier, massive inscription, also mentioned House of David, or Beit David, Bet David. And over the past 30 years, his uh, the understanding of whether or not there's been big arguments back and forth because the the original stone itself, uh, the original inscription itself, <clears throat> that was recorded sometime, uh, it looks like in the 9th century uh, BCE, so 100, and, 100 or so years after David, 150 years after David, that was destroyed, broken down, but not before a, a squeeze was made of it. A squeeze, like a a kind of like a paper mache indentation of the actual inscription itself. And so we have both of these, part of the actual uh, inscription and then a squeeze that was produced before the inscription was broken down, broken. And so since 1992, there's been this ongoing debate whether it says House of David or not a House of David. Well, this article in the Biblical Archaeology Review puts it all to rest, or it should do, put this argument to rest finally that the Misha Stella as well says House of David. Now, the Aramaic in uh, the Tel Dan Stela 
uh, has an extra letter in byte. Um, this one doesn't. Uh, it's got the it's got the B and the T, if I can put, call it that, in these uh, ancient alphabetical languages. And then David, written right after that. I'll just quote from this article right now. This is written by André Lamare, uh, Lemaire, uh, and Jean-Philippe Delorme, or something like that. Um, apologies for my lack of ability in the French language. Nevertheless, this is what these authors say. And this is the one of these is the original uh, proponent of this inscription mentioning House of David. And this inscription is so important. And outside of even the House of David, it talks to the geographic setting, uh, the, the a, a scene from that kind of matches with the Bible. It talks about the tribe of Gad. It talks about the House of Omri in the north, uh, the northern Israelite state, if we can call it that. So there's other biblical figures that are confirmed from this uh, inscription that was written by the Moabites. So this is the people that were across the Jordan River, just uh, kind of south um, towards the eastern, the, the, yeah, the eastern side of the Dead Sea. So this is a very important inscription. inscription. Uh, reading from this article, and I'll leave an, a link to this in the show notes of today's program, it says this, the authors, despite the inscription's importance and uniqueness, rivaled perhaps only by the famous Tal Dan Steeler, discovered in 1993, many questions remain about its content, especially whether the expression Bet David, House of David, meaning Bet meaning House of, and David uh, meaning David, can be found in a fragmented and particularly poorly preserved portion of the text. While I, speaking of the original proponent, uh, uh, first proposed this reading nearly three decades ago based on paleographic and contextual considerations, especially the text's internal parallelism and the date of the content of the Tel Dan Stila, very much the same time period as the Tel Dan Stila. Improved photographic evidence has allowed scholars to gain new insights into the Stila's most problematic sections. These insights, which we discuss here, not only confirm that the Mesha Stila uh, or the Misha Stila references the House of David, but also allows us to draw new conclusions about the various historical and biblical events described in the text. And it goes on to talk about how there are a series of new um, photographs, different imagery that was taken in 2015 at the University of Southern California. And then there were new images that were taken at the Louvre uh, in Paris in 2018 and of the squeeze itself, and these new images should put to rest the inscription and what it, and what it says, um, clearly indicating that it does indeed say House of David. Later on, it says this, The confirmed presence of Beth David and the Misha Stella offers important insights into the history of the kingdom of Judah, especially regarding its political entity and the extent of its political hegemony. The idiom, House of David, now firmly identified in both the Tel Dan and Mishra inscriptions, mirrors the names of several Aramaic and Levantine kingdoms that use Bet or House of to preface the name of the dynasty's founding ruler, House of Adini, House of Agusi, House of Omri. And then it talks about how this was in existence in the 10th and the eight, to the 8th century. And this is really wonderful. This is what the Bible talks about in this period specifically. The, the kingdom of Judah is going to be known as the house of David. And you'll remember the famous refrain that, uh, um, that Shema and that Jeroboam the first said, this is during David's reign, and then after uh, the death of Solomon, they say, to your tents, O Israel, O house of Israel, what have we with the house of David, with Bet David? It's time to get out of here. They, they're not going to treat us fairly. Let's break off the kingdom of, from the kingdom of Judah. And how was it known? It was known by its patriarch, the house of David. That's the biblical language that's used to describe the southern kingdom, often in this period. And it's the same language that's used to describe uh, the kingdom of Judah in these two inscriptions now, both from the 9th century, about 150 years after King David, and both of them referencing the house of David, the patriarch of this kingdom. 
Now, there is a, an exact uh, quote. I think there's uh, one other thing that's very interesting about this, because they have a new reading of the inscription. I think we're going to have to update even our article about this, and hopefully we'll have an article next week or the week following um, about the new reading uh, based on new imagery. Uh, but this is what it says later on, again, from the Biblical Archaeology Review. The presence of House of David in the Misha Stila further implies that the territory of the kingdom of Judah extended across the Dead Sea included and included some areas of Transjordan at the very least during the 9th century BCE. But it goes on to say that it's probably during the 10th century as well. Why? That's exactly what the Bible says. You go to 2 Samuel chapter 8. Uh, no, yeah, Second Samuel chapter 8, that's it. And it talks about the first 14 verses of that chapter. Talk about all the territorial expansion that happened to the kingdom of Judah and Israel, that were together at the time, under King David. It talks about the garrisons of Edom coming under David's, which is to the south of this area. It talks about Moab, it talks about Ammon bringing gifts to David, being subjugated to David. This is territory that David, a lot of this territory that David did not um, remove the people from and go out and boot them out and put Israelites there. Um, obviously, the territories of Gad and Reuben that did belong to part of this, that had ownership to part of this territory, they did belong there. But these other people had rights to these lands as well. And yet, David made sure that they paid homage to him. So the Bible indicates that David occupied uh, and was in control over this area in the 10th century. No, also during the, the, the reign of Jehoshaphat in the 9th century, that Judah was in control of this territory also. Continuing on from this quote, In particular, we now read in lines 31 to 33 of the inscription this, quote, As for Horonine, the house of David dwelt in it. And Chemosh said to me, go down, fight against Horonain, Horonain. And I went down and fought against the city and took it. So just an interesting new reading uh, to this. And not just the context, well, not just the con, what's important is not just this new reading in terms of the context of who controlled this territory and when, but the fact that now we have another inscription that mentions the house of David and inscription that is confirmed, confirmed by several archaeologists. I do remember a program that I gave back in 2019. This was in response to a, uh, a new study that came out from several archaeologists here in Israel uh, in 2019 that talked about the Misha Stella and they wanted to propose a new reading for it. And they talked about this inscription instead of meaning uh, talking about David uh, this portion of the inscription possibly, most likely, refer maybe even references Balak, Balak, the 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 leader from the from the story of Balaam, you'll remember from the Bible, and we just looked at that and said, well, it's just amazing that they're willing to stretch these archaeologists, um, not even epigraphists, uh, stretch this inscription to mean absolutely anything but David, anything Balak. And other gave some other ideas about who it might be. And the stretch was just, it was a huge stretch to make them think that this didn't say House of David. And, and then immediately following that, um, there was another professor that came out and said, no, we've got the new imagery. It definitely says House, De House of David. There's two dots either side of Beth and David indicating that this is something that goes together. You can't separate these two things, Beth, David. They go together. And now we have even more evidence. And I think this is just wonderful vindication uh, for the original proponent of this. Again, I will not try and butcher <laughs> Andre Lamar. Uh you came out and said 1992, this is what it said, based on the best reading contextually that you could find there for the inscription. And then here we are a, uh, a decade or three decades later, I should say, and technology has developed to confirm this original reading. So no longer will we say in the realm of biblical archaeology that there is one inscription that definitely says House of David attesting to the reign of Judah's greatest king, uh, of which the throne of David is named after, but we will say that there is most definitely 
two, two. So more vindication and corroboration for the biblical King David. Not just David as existing, but David as the creator of and the patriarch of a kingly dynasty. So much so that 150 years after he came and went, you have the southern kingdom of Judah still being known by its dynastic founder, David, King David. Okay, now we're going to cut across to Armstrong Auditorium. This is located on the campus of Herbert W. Armstrong College. And this is at the very start of a speech that Professor Josef Garfinkel of Hebrew University uh, gave to our students there, some students and some faculty members, uh, and some of the public that were invited to uh, see the presentation. The full presentation we're going to play for you at a, on a later podcast or, or just put it up on the website, armstronginstitute.org, to stand alone. And you can see his really interesting um, uh, presentation about Davidic period uh, excavations that have that have that he's been a part of over the past um, about 15 years. But right now we're going to go to his first public remarks following the discovery of this 3700 year old alphabetical inscription, the earliest alphabetical inscription discovered in Israel. And here is Professor Yosef Garfinkel. Okay, okay. It's an... Okay, it's a great, a great pleasure to be here uh, this uh, afternoon and to give you a lecture about the work I'm doing in the last 12 years or so. And it's a wonderful uh, <coughs> welcome. Uh, I got a wonderful welcome, uh, whatever the word is. See, English is not my mother tongue. But I really enjoy, I'm enjoying very much to be here. And yesterday we saw a wonderful <laughs> foot uh, basketball play which you know last and last and last with two more extensions and in the end oh poor <laughs> Oklahoma didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow I will talk today about my excavations in two sites which are identified as Sharaim and also in Ciklag but before I was asked to give you <coughs> moment to, to this specific uh, discovery that you see here. This is, this is an ivory comb, and it's only three centimeters. That means an inch and quarter of an inch. Very, very uh, small. As you can see, one side, the teeth are well preserved, and they are quite condensed. The other side has bigger teeth, but all of them has been broken. But you can see part of the beginning of these uh, teeth. And it's quite similar, as a matter of fact, to modern teeth, but to modern uh, combs like this with two type of teeth. But today they're made from uh, plastic, you know, or maybe from uh, metal. And this one is made from ivory. It was excavated in 2016. So this already six years ago. And we saw the, the comb, of course, and there was some research. People looked at it in microscopes. They tried to find lice, because sometimes we have lice on ancient uh, comb. And indeed, a lice was found, not a live one, of course, a dead one. <laughs> and they tried to do DNA analysis to the lice, because from the DNA, you can study uh, other aspect of it. But uh, there was not enough material, so the DNA uh, studies uh, didn't uh, succeed. And then suddenly, after six years, it was holding a different perspective or in a bit different lighting. And what's happened? That there are 17 letters on it. Now, the ivory is a rather delicate material. So when somebody uh, engraved the letters, it didn't make much pressure because the whole ivory could, uh, have been broke, uh, could be broken. So the incision is really millimeter by millimeter, and they are very, very thin. But altogether, we have 17 letters. <laughs> And they are quite, they don't like, like more than ABC, but this is the earliest ABC we have in the world. <clears throat> if you uh, remember, the writing was invaded in the fourth millennium BC, first in Mesopotamia, the Sumerian, where they have cuneiform uh, tablets and cuneiform script, and later in Egypt, the hieroglyph system in Egypt. Both systems were very complicated because they have hundreds and of different signs. And only scribes who learned how to read and write were able to read these ancient doc the ancient documents in Mesopotamia and Egypt. Even the kings didn't know how to read and write. 
they need a scribe that will write for them and read for them. And the Canaanite, about uh, 3,800 years ago, invented the alphabet. Okay, instead of having complicated writing systems, they work on phonetic. Okay, if you want to say something, you don't need to write in the, the whole letter, but you can break it into the phoneticus and have signs on it. And this is really <coughs> the earliest uh, sentence we have in alphabet. Now, it's not, the, uh, it's not the only one. We maybe have, till today, maybe 70 different inscriptions have been found. But what's the problem with all these 70 inscriptions? You have few letters only, or maybe a word, and sometimes two words, but we never have a sentence. This is the first sentence ever written, in, or not ever written, ever found in alphabet. And now let's see what is written here. <coughs> it's there in Canaanite and also in Hebrew letters because the Can from the Canaanite we have the Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, Phoenician, and from the Phoenician the alphabet spread into Greece and Latin and then to all the other uh, languages in the world. And what you see here is the earliest example of alphabet that is also known in Sarabit al-Khadem in, in Sinai, where uh, the first, uh, this type of inscription were, were, were first found. Anyhow, it's written here, you see the second row, Itash, Chat, Zi, Lekamal, Se'ar, Vezakat, which means destroy this ivory, but, or this, in English it will be, this, you can make this task not comb, task, they're talking about an elephant task, the task, probably because it's a, a, the raw material is very rare. You need to hunt an elephant in Africa to get the ivory, and then ivories were probably transferred to Egypt and from Egypt to Lachish. So the, the material itself is uh, very rare and very expensive. So they mentioned the, the name, the material, and not the, the, and not the object itself. So maybe this task root out lies from hair and beard. This is funny, I know everybody laughing when they hear. This is the earliest sentence alphabet. <laughs> it's not my fault, I just found it, I didn't write it. <laughs> but it's very human. You know, it's not a king, I killed my enemies, you know, this type of royal inscriptions that we have a lot from the ancient Near East. This is something personal. This is a problem that people face, and they, were, they need to get rid of the lies, and uh, they wrote this wish, you know, that uh, the, 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 the comb will do the work properly. So this is the earliest alphabet in, uh, sentence we have so far. And hopefully in the future more and more will be found, and uh, in the end we will know much more about the Canaanite language. Because one of the problems is that we don't have Canaanite inscriptions. We have an inscription in Egypt, we have inscription in Mesopotamia, but we don't have Canaanite inscription here in the southern Levant. Maybe you know in Ugarit, we have Ugar Ugaritic inscription, but they have different alphabet. And their alphabet uh, disappeared when Ugarit has been destroyed in the end of the late bronze. But the Canaanite alphabet continued to be used by the Israelite, and as a matter of fact, the Bible is written in alphabet. And if you think about it, <coughs> without alphabet, the Bible would not be written. So this is really a most important intellectual achievement of the Canaanites, and invented the simple writing technique of the alphabet. And all of us today, maybe in China they don't use it, but almost everywhere in the world, people using ABC, <coughs> the alphabet. So this is a Canaanite heritage to all of us. And that's why it was so important, and we have a large report in the New York Times, the BBC talk about it, CNN, the London Times, the Guardian, and you can name it, hundreds and hundreds of journals and media all over the world, yesterday and today, are publishing this uh, very unique uh, discovery. That was Professor Josef Garfinkel at Armstrong Auditorium, which is on the campus of Herbert W. Armstrong College. Yeah, just north of Edmond, Oklahoma. He was there to uh, tour the campus and speak to our students about his uh, discoveries related to the time period of King David, Solomon, and Rehoboam, this period of the United Monarchy. And we just happened to catch him when this amazing discovery was released from his excavations at Lachish. 
If you want to see the rest of his presentation, um, just keep track of what we're doing at the Armstrong Institute. Um, you can do that by going to the website, armstronginstitute.org, and you'll scroll down. You'll find a place to put in your email address. We won't flood your email address with multiple emails. We'll only send you something when we have new content up on the website, something that you're interested in, I'm sure. Uh, and we'll make sure that you'll, you'll be uh, notified when the rest of that presentation is online. Also, what you'll find there on the website is a place to sign up for our free Biblical Archaeology magazine. This is called Let the Stone Speak. The latest issue has features the life and work of Dr. Elot Mazar, uh, this really just wonderful lady who excavated here, archaeologist and scholar, excavated here in Jerusalem for decades. Uh, this looks at her discoveries related to the time periods of King David, King Solomon, uh, time periods of Hezekiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and even the later periods relating to the Herodian period, the period of the for, of Jerusalem's destruction at the hands of the Romans, and even, even later as well. So this looks back on her life and work, this specific issue. Uh, you, of course, can sign up for a full year's subscription for free. We'll never charge you for it. Um, but if you want this one in particular of Dr. Elot Mazar's work, you're going to have to write an email to me. Uh, you can uh, write an email to letters at armstronginstitute.org, letters at armstronginstitute.org, requesting this issue. Simply put your name and your physical address <clears throat> And we'll make sure you get a copy uh, wherever you are in the world. Please just be a little patient. It's going to be sent from Israel. Uh, so it might take a little bit of time to get to you. But nevertheless, we'll make sure that you get a copy. Thank you very much for taking time to be with me today. Thank you very much to Professor Joseph Garfinkel for coming to our, uh, our college back in Oklahoma and presenting uh, his new discovery and his talk on the Davidic era discoveries of, his, of, of more of his career as well. Um, and thanks very much again for being with us uh, today, and we'll talk to you next week.